Enrichment, Enlightenment, Transformation. Rabbi Yisrael Cutler, the spiritual leader of Chabad of Cary, North Carolina, guides anyone who has been searching for a meaningful life and conscious living. Join our discussions about the mundane, our daily activities, and then infuse every day with a spiritual twist from the inspired sages of the Talmud and Jewish mysticism, which many call Kabbalah. We learn from the root source of all religious monotheistic traditions and delve into the symbolism and levels of meaning from biblical stories. Thank you to everyone joining us live here in Cary, North Carolina, as well as anyone tuning in from all over the world. If you are listening, please, please let us know. We love your questions. We love your feedback. Today is June 21st, 2016. The portion of the week is Bahalotcha. And for those with the textbooks, it's on page 146. Last week, I didn't have the books. Um, I actually left them somewhere, and I had another topic I wanted to teach, but I got comments, both an email from online, as well as people here, why do we skip last week's Parsha, last week's class? It was all about gematria, which is the numerical value of letters, and sort of how the system began, what is its meaning, it sounds very random, and it was a whole class about the numerology, I guess that would be the best translation for gematria. Um, so we're not doing it this week, but in a few weeks' time, I plan to do that class again because it is interesting. Um, it's a good general class just to understand how the system developed. We're not doing that this week, though. I just wanted to address it because I know people asked about it. I taught Anne on Thursday. You taught Anne about it. But this is going to be taking a step back. Where did it develop? What are the different systems? Um, okay. We are now at the portion in the Torah that actually a lot of people wait for because we've had a few months where it's all stories about, not stories, all laws about offerings and sacrifices and building of the sanctuary and counting the Jews. Now we're up to the good old stories. The stories, though, that happen while the Jews are traveling in the wilderness. Um, a lot of stories of kvetching, complaining. So in this week, the Jews kvetch where's the beef? They want meat. It's not enough to have their own animals. They want God to provide the meat for them, right? But we're not going to do that story. Um, next week is the spies, very famous story. But the end of this week's Torah portion is a few lines about Moshe's sister, Miriam. And it seems to be a story that is not all that um, critical to Jewish development, our story. And yet, I want to raise your attention to something very interesting. There is a tradition. After the morning prayers every day, and if you open to a traditional siddur, when the prayers are over, there'll be something called the sheish zichirot, the six remembrances. Okay? Every day we're supposed to remember six things. So what do you think makes the cut? What national events of our people make the cut of the six things we're supposed to remember daily? Guess. Sinai. Sinai. The giving of the Torah at Sinai, yes. The Exodus, yes. The Brit Ben Haktarim. So that actually is is not. The Exodus is included in that. Not all of them are. are um, one of them is remembering Shabbat, the concept oh, okay. of Shabbat. Okay, so every that's not Every Shabbat, an we're not. Yeah, it's not an event. Okay. Shabbat is not every day of the week, and that's why in, in, in Hebrew, the days of the week are not Sunday, Monday, but we actually call them day one, day two, all as a lead up to Shabbat, which is the seventh day. Um, there is the Jews travels in the wilderness and the way they fetched. I don't know. We can have another discussion why that should be one of the six. There's remembering anti-Semitism, remembering Amalek. Uh -huh. Okay. So the, the, those four, anti-Semitism, Shabbat, Exodus, Sinai, seem pretty major. And the sixth is an odd one. What Remember how Miriam gossiped about Moses at the end of this Parsha. And again, it seems to be a kind of minor incident in the Torah, and yet that makes its way to one of the six remembrances. And we're going to do the story inside now. It's odd, though, that it is seen to be that big that it gets mentioned. Um, 
And what we're going to say today is gossip is, A, that important, that critical of an issue, and B, that challenging to stay away from, that we need constant reminders of it. Okay? Um, there's some mitzvot that you can study once and learn all the details and you know it for life. There's some mitzvot that you might know the ideas, but you need reminders constantly. You know, you need reminders constantly about it. I'll give you an idea. Uh, another example. In a few weeks' time, I'm giving a seminar on gratitude. Everyone knows how important gratitude is to well-being. And yet, unless you remind yourself of these ideas constantly, you will not put them to use in your life. The same thing is true with Lashon Hara Gasset. It is so challenging to keep ourselves away from, and it is that important of an issue that it is ranked as one of the six remembrances. Another example, and then we'll go to the first text. In the Amida that we say, Hello, I need the song. so in the Amida, the Shemona Esri, the central Jewish prayer that we say, there's a lot of blessings asking for this need and that need, and then there's a final paragraph at the end before we say, Oseh Shalom Bim Lafu Yaseh. And we ask God in that prayer. Yes, guard my tongue. Thank you, Judy. You took the words out of my mouth. I want to give the exact translation over here. We say in that prayer. My God, guard my tongue from evil and my lips from speaking deceitfully. Now, typically, when it comes to requests of God, we ask God for our physical needs, right? When it comes to our spiritual needs, we don't ask God. Who's, <laughs> that's, that's our job. That's our job. We don't have divine assistance, so to speak. And we have freedom of choice to do what is right. Why would we be asking Hashem for help in not gossiping? It's up to you. <laughs> So what are we asking? Or what do you think we're, we're asking? What is, the, what is the request? We don't ask Hashem for help in, in not stealing. We don't ask Hashem for help in, in, in you know, Shabbos. It, well, maybe... Some, yeah, what are you going to say? Uh, it just, no, I, I'm, I'm waiting for the answer. <laughs> <laughs> maybe some words that we don't think are going to be hurtful end up mm -hmm. being... Okay, that's good. Scary. Sometimes we don't realize the ramifications of our words, so even if we think we're on guard, we're not. And B is Torah acknowledges that this is a mitzvah that is incredibly difficult. As humans, words just flow from our mouth. That's just the way it happens. And we need divine assistance. We need help. We're asking Hashem, help me out in this area of life because it is seen to be that critical. And if there's ever a time to discuss this, you know, in the world today, there's so much. Everyone talks about everybody. And every year, it's worthwhile to have a class on Lashon Hara because gossip, because um, you can't have enough of it. Let's, let's dive into the portion, text 1a. Okay. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses regarding the Cushite woman who he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. They, did they gossip outside of the two of them? Or was it just the two of them talking to each other? Just the two of them okay. talking to each other, which Brother is uh, which is astonishing. And, I know, I know. That's... And they meant well. So right, right, we're right. going to say why this story is something we have to remember. Well, why don't you okay, continue? continue. <laughs> they said, "God has God spoken only to Moses? Hasn't he spoken to us too? And God heard. As now, God doesn't usually hear, but yeah. God he hears and takes action. Yeah. Now this man Moses was exceedingly humble, more so than any person on the face of the earth. God suddenly said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Go out, all three of you, to the tent of meeting. And all three went out. God descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent. And he called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went out. So now he separates Moshe from Aaron and Miriam and has a chit-chat with them yeah. privately. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Moses is left out of this one because it's yeah. about him. He, he, he said, office. yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, please listen to my words. If there be prophets among you, I, God, will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak to him in a dream. Not so my servant, Moses. He is, a, he is faithful throughout my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth. In a vision and not in riddles. And he beholds the image of God. So why were you not afraid to speak against my servant, Moses? The wrath of God flared against them and he left. 
The cloud departed above the tent, and behold, Miriam was afflicted with Sazerat. Which is this, Sazerat is this skin condition that we have elsewhere in the Torah. As white as snow. Then Aaron turned to Miriam, and behold, she was afflicted with Sarat. Very odd story. Even, uh, the, last, even the last verse is odd. And just she. It's, it's prophetic. She was Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Um... Right, because we're actually going to talk about both speaking and listening. So Miriam might have spoken, but Aaron kind of listened in as well. How come he didn't oh, get oh. punished? Okay. That's um, what, what which is an interesting is question. It's a good question. So let's, the incident itself is very odd. All it says is they said something about Moshe's wife. Well, no, again, about Moses marrying that woman. Correct, but then right afterwards, they say... Didn't God, is God only speak to Moshe? He speaks to us too. So there is some information we don't know about what they were speaking about. And for that, we need the Midrash. We need oral tradition to tell us what were they saying about Moshe's wife. Um, I, I have to say, as an intervention goes, this is attention getting. This is what? Attention getting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> So that is the story. So he mar- he had married a long time ago a woman from the tribe of from the land of Midian, and they're talking about her and they're complaining. Though what are they complaining? Has God only spoken to Moshe? He speaks to us as well. Then it tells us this little interesting tidbit about Moshe being very humble, which seems to be out of place over here. Then the Torah discusses the difference between the level of prophecy of Moses and everyone else which is everyone else, when they had a communication from God, it was either in a dream or in a riddle. And the way I understand that, it's kind of hard to understand us people that understand what prophecy means, but we are finite, God is infinite. So when God communicates to mankind, something has to happen in order for the infinite message to come to a finite person. Either the message has to be very, very, very diluted, or the person has to be in a state where they're not so conscious because then their ego is not getting in the way and they can sort of access the more infinite side of them. So the message being diluted would mean what? A riddle, a metaphor, or they are sleeping or it's a dream. They're not in a state where they are themselves because them being themselves is a contradiction to the infinite message. They almost have to lose themselves to get something higher. So God says, normally, whenever I communicate with mankind, and it's interesting, there are levels of prophecy. Maimonides ranks levels of prophecy. So you have, you know, you have a Moses, and then it goes all the way down. And the lowest would be what we call today Ruach HaKodesh, which would be divine inspiration. It's not prophecy per se. It's not the Lord saying something to you. Oh, I think we mentioned it last week when I said how the book of Ruth is different than the other books of the Torah, where there's not a direct communication with mankind, but is written with divine inspiration. That's the lowest level of prophecy. And to a certain extent, I would say that is what righteous men and women in the world can still have today. Ruach HaKodesh, an intuition, a godly intuition. Prophecy would be Hashem communicating with people. And on that, we have many levels, even in biblical times, and different ranks. Both Miriam and Moshe had communication, excuse me, both Miriam and Aaron had communication with God. And that happens right here, in this story itself. But Hashem says there's a difference. So it's interesting that a few verses earlier, the Torah gives us this little tidbit about Moshe being very humble, humble, which is an explanation why his level of prophecy was able to be on a higher level. So there was nobody home. There was no I. There was no sense of ego. And as a result, you just had a divine soul. And as a result, it was able to tolerate a higher level of prophecy. Okay. What did Miriam say about Moshe? So, yes. I'm going to interesting that this morning when I was studying the Zohar. God spoke to you? Yes. <laughs> and said that um, Moses got the direct light because it came from Hephra. Mm-hmm. Where the other prophecy was Shekinah because she has no light of her own. And that's why it wasn't a straight connection. It was a bounce off. 
is a reflection from. But but the very fact that others had to get it from Shekhinah right. means it has to undergo another Layer. Um, filter. Right. Malchut would be a filter that makes it more subject to the world. And therefore, it bounces. Beautiful. As opposed to Moshe, who is able to access it from a higher place and therefore direct. So in 1b, we're actually told what they were complaining about. And this is not something very well known. And everyone is going to be very shocked to hear this. But the very fact that, that this is the only such example in Torah shows that this is not the norm. I don't know if you know this, but after the giving of the Torah, Moshe's family life was not normal. His marital life was not normal. Now, generally in Judaism, there's we, marriage is a mitzvah, having children is a mitzvah. We're not into, um, you know, the priest absent. That's not a Jewish idea at all. Now, there was a, in biblical times, every time a man and woman were intimate with one another, then the man and the woman, actually, for that matter, would have to go to mikvah before going into the Temple Mount and other things. Man and woman would have to go to, not because it's dirty or evil, no, but there's a certain state of purity, and we've had other classes that discuss potential life and what happens when potential life leaves your body. There's a, um, there's a vacuum. The point of the class is not to discuss that. Someone would have to go to mikvah. They would have to immerse in a mikvah before they would go to the sanctuary. Not a big deal. Just have a little bath. That's fine. For most people, it wasn't a big deal. The problem was Moshe got divine communication all the time, didn't know when it would come. And as a result, for this, this portion of his life, he was not living in an intimate fashion with his wife, and they were complaining about that, saying that that isn't right. Okay. So, so they meant saying, very, that's what, so. What did you text, marry her for if you were not going to be her? And husband? they said, we are prophets, and we okay. managed to have a normal marital life, and everyone else is prophets. Yeah, and, God's not talking to you every other day. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't want anyone to get it's the a bird. Yeah. <laughs> well, that. But that explains sort of what's going on in this story. Because when you just read the verses, you don't, you don't get that. You don't get that. Um, but again, I want to make sure no one leaves with the wrong idea here. That is not the Jewish idea in general. <laughs> the fact that Moses is the only one that that happened to means something. Generally, we encourage normal family life, normal intimate life in a way of holiness, of course. But um, that's a big part of the Jewish experience. He was a little yes. But not on his terms, on no, God's no, terms. He had, he had a cell phone, he couldn't turn it off. <laughs> exactly, that was the problem. He never, you know. So, and the yeah. Isha Kushi, I, I, I remember sure. reading that it was someone else, not Zipporah. No, this is Zipporah. This is absolutely okay. Zipporah. But okay. the question then is, why does it mix that into this as well? It starts off saying he married a Kushite woman, and then afterwards it speaks about the prophecy. There's, we could have another class on, on what that was all about. But the point of this is they spoke about Moshe. And A, who do they speak to? Only each other. B is, I think they actually felt bad for her. They meant very, very well. This is not your classic, classic case of gossip when someone is gossiping for no reason whatsoever. And nonetheless, for people on their spiritual level, this will still seem to be a flaw. And as such, Miriam gets this skin condition for a week, um, which is one of the strongest proofs in the Torah that one got this skin condition when they got it. Because when you read the whole portion about the skin condition, it just discusses the condition and how you get pure and how you become impure. But it doesn't actually say why people got it in biblical times. This story, though, is a very strong thing about that. Okay. Rabbi? Yes. What if someone thought gossip but didn't speak it? Good. We're going to get to that a little oh, bit later okay. today. So if, so text 1C now says, one Judy, 1C, one 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 page 149, the Midrash yeah. writes. Now, if Miriam, who did not intend to disparage Moses, was punished, 
all the more so someone who intentionally disparages his fellow with Lashon Hara should be stricken with sin. Today we don't have those miraculous conditions, but there is a flaw. There's a spiritual flaw. They have become dirty. The words that they say leave an imprint on their soul. So we see Miriam's example every day to make us think. Um, in, in Talmudic jargon, this is called a Tal Bachomer. If, if Miriam's was considered bad, how much more so the typical slander that we do, which is not productive. Miriam meant well. I think she actually wanted to accomplish something. The problem is maybe she should have had a chat with Moshe first. Well, it maybe like there was other parts of the conversation. I, I don't know. Like yes, right. So, so, like. so one trouble I have is that if this is all about, you know, Moses and family life isn't what it ought to be. It, the text starts off Correct. in which really a more of an insulting form. Kusha, he married. Of, uh, our brother married that woman <laughs> from the undesirable place. Is what the the uh, pashat? Tells. Correct. Correct. Well, there's the first part of the pashat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And we need to. So it could. So you're saying from the pashat, it seems that there was something else mixed into here as well about as, as, his as choice. To his poor wife, and, and, and you know, we, we were worried about them. Correct. However, God's response has to do with your level of prophecy is different than Moshe's level of prophecy. So that would be where the Midrash's explanation makes sense. But, I, but I, I'm with you. There's something about that first line that implies that there was more to this conversation as well. Okay. And also, it looks like to me that she had told Miriam herself that Oh, she did. She good. did. She did. And that's, that's what that's happened. I, I, skipped in, yeah. I skipped 1B. And what happened in 1B was Miriam was beside Moshe's wife when the news came out that there were some other prophets amongst them. And Sipar heard this and said, oh, yeah, I feel bad for their wives. <laughs> because obviously those other husbands are now going to be secluded. And Miriam's like, huh? I never heard of that before. I'm a prophet and that doesn't happen to me. To which Sipar says, well, that's what happened to me. So it sounds like this wasn't known until this point. Was okay. Miriam married? Yeah, absolutely. To who? Nachshon ben Amida. Someone yeah, online, no. if someone can search who Miriam's yes, husband Mary, was. She, no, Miriam's Mary. husband was the first to walk, to walk into, into the, the water. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Nachshon. Okay, that's what it was. Nachshon. We have an educated crowd here. Better. <laughs> say, say it again, Bye. Rabbi. Say it again. Research who was what? Miriam's husband? Was the question no. that people here were. Um, grappling with and we have a few people that are suggesting it was the man who jumped into the sea first by the name of Nachshon so we need to well, fact check that one what's the difference here I mean maybe uh, to me you know, when you're reading this it's like Miriam was interfering in the mm -hmm. marriage by putting that in there so I mean it does appear that she was trying to be helpful she was if she was chatting with her friends over a cup of coffee about it then you can say it's gossip yeah. she you was yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this was not people you know you know yentas over coffee this was she was talking to her brother about their sister it sounds that this was for the sake of something productive coming out of it. so it's just like staying out of your brother's marriage no, there was something about this there was well, something about this yes according to Chabad.org, it was Caleb. 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 Oh. Caleb? Wow. I didn't know that. Yes. Who's got a big I'm part coming up? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's... Yeah? Good. That's like... Caleb Ben Yifumi. He was, he, was, he was one of the righteous spies. Yes, I know. Uh -huh. After this story, he was away from his wife yeah, for 40 and, uh, days. So. Let's, let's go back to Joshua. Let's go back... So what's interesting is here, right after this story, we have the story of the spies next week. And the Midrash juxtaposes the two stories. Text 2, page 149. The story of the spies was likewise juxtaposed with the story of Miriam, where they slandered the land. The very next biblical story is... Caleb and 11 others going to the land of Israel to scout out the land. It's a biblical story where next week the Jews say, I know we're going to the land of Israel, but is it everything you guys have told us? We want to see it for ourselves. And 
we also want to make sure we're able to conquer it. So they sent 12 people ahead to spy out the land. And these 12 people came back with a very negative report of the land. Not all of them, but 10 out of the 12. And they said, there's no way we can conquer it. It's a mighty land. The people are warriors. We are going to get crushed if we go there. And that started a whole rebellion amongst the Jews. They wanted to go back to Egypt. And the punishment of next week's story was a lot worse than Miriam's story. What was next week's story's punishment? 40 years, 40 years in the wilderness. Well, basically, you, got, you all die. Well, that also. <laughs> so, but what is the connection between the end of this week and next week? It may not be chronological, by the way. I don't know at what point in the story Miriam spoke about Moshe. But the Torah inserts these two stories next to each other because, well, because they should have learned about the effects of Lashon Hara, and they didn't. Here they didn't speak about a person, but they spoke about the land of Israel in a negative way, and that also causes death. Yes. In Moses, in Moses in trouble because he acted on that cock gossip and sent the spies. So I didn't, didn't space. We'll do that next week. Okay. Next week. Next week we'll we'll dive into the whole spy story. But we see a correlation between this week's story as well as next week's story. Could I just ask yes. why they're spies and not scouts? Good question. The correct translation actually should be scouts. And in fact, one of the mistakes is that they looked at themselves as spies and not scouts. Um, they were supposed to be on a fact-finding mission. They weren't supposed to be advisors and, and you know, so that, good, good question. And in Hebrew, they are actually called, that is what we call them. When Moshe sent them out, he tells them, La tour et aretz. Tour, guess what it means? The same word in English, to tour. We call them miraglim spies, but they are never in the biblical story called spies. They were supposed to tour the land. Tour, tour, come back, take a few photos, come back, and then, uh, you know, give your findings. They came back. And the first way we know they spoke Lush and Haraz, who should they have reported directly to when they came back? Well, Moses. Moses. Instead, they held a press conference with the entire Jewish people. <laughs> <laughs> they did. It says they came back and told everyone. And that, of course, is one of the key distinctions between Lush and Haraz and productive talk. In productive talk, you only tell the party that is important. Lush and Haraz, you tell everyone. And that is why in Miriam's story, they only spoke to our own. And she's put on such a high pedestal that she's punished, how much more so in general. Text 3 is a famous line from Maimonides about the evils mm -hmm. of slander. Yeah. The sages said, La Shon Hara kills three people. The one who speaks it, the one who listens to it, and the one about whom it is spoken. Okay, so there are three people who are harmed in La Shon Hara. Speaking, listening, and the one about whom it is spoken. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Because of time, I think we're going to skip some of the um, next... Section 2 is Lashon Hara in history. If you scan through the Torah, there are other examples of Lashon Hara that are very, very um, major. <clears throat> we spoke about Moses. Moses grew up in Egypt. Then he ran off and went to Midian where he married Zipporah. Why did Moshe have to run off? Decades of Moses' life, he is away from Egypt. He killed the Egyptian who was hurting the Jew. But he did it quietly. He did it quietly. No one saw. There was an Egyptian taskmaster who was beating a Jew to death. Moshe intervened and saved the Jew. And then what happened? Let's do that text inside. Um... Please read text 5b. 5b. And he retort. Oh, he, he went, went out on the second day, and behold, two Hebrew men were quarreling, and he said to the wicked one, Why are you going to strike your friend? Well, the second day was two Jews who were fighting, not the Egyptian and the Jew. Two Jews were fighting amongst themselves, and he says, Why are you guys fighting? And he gave and the he classic told, Jewish response. Well, yeah, who made you boss? <laughs> who made you a man, a prince, and a judge over us? Do you plan to slay me as you have slain the Egyptian? Moses became frightened and said, 
indeed the matter has become known. Okay. And he leaves town because these Jews slander on him. And the Midrash says something very scary. When he says, indeed, the matter has been known, he doesn't just mean um, the fact that I killed this Egyptian was known. The Midrash continues and says, now I understand a little bit better why the Jews are in trouble spiritually. Okay. There is Lashon Hara taking place. Mm -hmm. How could it be that they slandered against me? I was trying to help them. Now that there's the infighting amongst the Jews, the matter is known to me why we're in such a weak spiritual state. So that would be a, another example in the Bible about Lashon Hara. The other text it brings over here is from much later in the Torah. I want to paraphrase it again because of time. Text 6, 6a, 6b. Rabbi, was this your laptop beeping at you? No, something okay. else. I'm not sure right. what it was. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is a story much, much later in the latter parts of the Tanakh. We have a King David, or a young King David. And he begins his career on the military front. He kills Goliath. But as soon as he does that, the king of the time becomes jealous of him. The king of that time is Saul, Saul. Saul Shaul. And although Shaul begins his career as a very righteous person, um, later in his career he had a series of setbacks. He became a little depressed. He became fearful. Um, and he actually is chasing after David because he is thinks that David is a threat to him. And he doesn't like the fact that David has become more popular than he has. David is fleeing. David runs to a city called Nob. And while he's running from Saul and while he's in Nob, he gets fed from the locals in Nob, who are all a city of priests. Someone snitches and says, hey, by the way, Saul, I heard that all these people fed the fugitive David. This guy's name is Doeg. He's featured many times in Tehillim, Psalms. King David writes about Doeg. Doeg had a dummy. Um, what does Saul do afterwards? What does Saul do? He runs, away. He runs not after David. He goes and punishes that entire horrific, horrific story. Very dark time in Jewish history. He kills the city who gave food to David. It's a horrible, it's a horrific, horrific story. Um, we have it in text 6b. He kills men, women, in that children, in that entire city. For So, of course, the sin is Shaul, Saul's. But who else is the responsible party here? No, not the, the fellow who snitched that, oh, I saw David. You know, this guy was trying to stir things up. And we know examples of that, where people try, you know, they know Shaul is angry. They know Shaul is, at this point in his career, really, um, he's in a state of depression, the Torah says. He was not himself at this point. And he sets him up, and he says, oh, by the way, I saw these people feeding David. And because of this gossip, it actually led to bloodshed. And it is because of stories like this that the Midrash compares gossip to bloodshed. And A is because spiritually, yes, you, you, you make someone humiliated and you hurt them spiritually. But there are enough examples in Jewish history where not only did it cause spiritual humiliation, but actual bloodshed. One example is the story of Doeg and David. And the most famous example would be much, much later in Jewish history, just before the fall of the Second Temple in Jerusalem, where one Jew, the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, familiar with that one? Let's do it together. Okay. Page 156. Text 8. Rabbi? On account of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. Oh, okay. On account of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, the holy temple was destroyed. There was a certain man whose friend was called Ka Kamsa, while his enemy was called Bar Kamsa. Get this straight, guys. you got to remember this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the man made a feast and told his servant to invite Kamsa. Instead, the servant invited Bar Kamsa. When the host found Bar Kamsa sitting at the feast, he said to him, You are my enemy. What are you doing here? Get up and leave. So Bar Kamsa gets the invitation and thought, Hey, maybe he's making up with me. That is why he's inviting me here. Great. And he humiliates him in public. Yeah. 
Our Kamsa replied, since I have already come, please allow me to remain, and I will pay you the worth of what I eat and drink. The host refused. Our Kamsa said, I will pay for half of the entire feast. The host refused. Our Kamsa said, I will pay for the entire feast. The host refused and bodily threw him out. <laughs> wow. Said Bar Kamsa, the rabbis were present, yet they did not protest this behavior. Evidently, they approved. I will slander them to Caesar in his And mind. then he ran to the Roman authority and he said that the Jews are planning a rebellion against you and made up charges. And that was the beginning of the end. Okay? I mean, this is a very telling story. That's even worse than gossip. It's lying. Right, that's lying. That's okay. And we actually have, and so now let's give some definitions. That is, is correct. Because gossip can be true. This is one step worse because it is false. It's called Mosi Shem Ra. Um, so we have enough examples in Jewish history where even physically it led to bloodshed. And these stories are are here because we need to remember just how damaging it is, just how damaging Lashon Hara is. Let's, so where in the Torah does it prohibit it? Text 9a. This is from the Torah portion about a month ago. Here it goes. 9a, page 158. And the Torah is very, very brief. It just says you can't gossip. It is only much later in history, and it's interesting. Even in the Talmud, you have a lot of stories about the danger of gossip. It doesn't really define it. It was only in the last about 100 years ago where there's a great, great, great rabbi named the Chafetz Chaim. Yisrael Kagan was his real name. He was called the Chafetz Chaim. And he wrote an entire treatise on the laws of gossip. And many times people study that. But what's interesting is it's not a, a, an ancient work that was written about 100 years ago. But a lot of the laws of gossip that people study are from him. The Torah only writes as follows. Where are we up to? Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 9A. <laughs> you shall not go, go around as a gossip monger amidst your people. You shall not stand by the shedding of your fellow's blood. I am God. So there are actually two different mitzvot in that verse. One is prohibited from gossiping, and also one cannot stand by idly when someone else's life and day is in danger. Um, the word in Hebrew in this verse is don't be a rachil. And what's interesting is rachil in biblical Hebrew also meant a peddler. Why? Because in those days, if you were a peddler, not only did you... You the news. You, the exactly. Story. And what that is telling us, though, is very interesting. The biblical Lashon Hara is actually one step not as bad as Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara in Hebrew means bad talk. Okay? Bad talk. Gossip. Gossip. So there are actually three levels. Rachil, Lashon Hara, and the last one, Motsi Shemra, which would be lying about it. You see that those would be the three levels. Rachil is not necessarily something that is bad talk. You're just talking about people. Did you hear they bought this car? Did you hear? But personal news in their life, that is not good. Like you want to call it neutral? Like Moses' wife, his sister and brother. Yeah, I mean, there they, they, they were speaking a little more negative about him. In their case, they were saying something that he was doing, in their opinion, wrong. Rachil means even neutral, but it's no one's business. That's what Rachil means. So let's do it in the code of Jewish law. First, Maimonides, who defines Rachil. How? Who is a gossiper, one who collects information and then goes from person to person saying, this is what so-and-so said. This is what I heard about so-and-so. Even if the statements are true, they bring about the destruction of the world. So neutral information that is completely irrelevant, it has no reason to be shared. And, um, you know, we can think of why is this so harmful? What's wrong with, with that? Um, but I think if we think about times in our life where those kinds of statements have led to something well, bad, you know, yes? How, how does the concept of the gossip you ever played the game telephone mm -hmm. when you were a kid? 
I tell for, one person mm -hmm. something, and then they tell another person. Mm -hmm. By the time Absolutely. it gets around the table, it's, it's a completely it's different correct. story. So, that, so it's very easy for Rachil to become Lashon Hara. Exactly. That's good. So one is Rachil easily slips into that. You know, and two is, there are times, and I was talking, reading a kid's story to my kid the other day, where, um, where someone asked their friend to come over, and they didn't want to offend them, they didn't want to say something bad, so they made up a story how they were going to da 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 da, da you know, whatever it was. And therefore, I can't come over and play. Well, the next day, that person was just talking to someone else about, I heard they went to here yesterday. And then that one now, that, no, they weren't. They were with me that day, you know? So then the information doesn't match up, and then someone is offended. So there are many times that can happen. But even beyond that, just there's no reason. Everyone has to know everything. So that is Rachil. Then we have Lashon Hara from the Code of Jewish Law. Back to you, Brian, text 10. Including in this prohibition is Lashon Hara, which is when a person talks ill of another, although he is speaking the truth. Even if one said, where there is always light, if not in the home and so-and-so, who always has meat and fish? One second, uh, let's That's see. Where is there always light? I guess there was, there was no electricity in those days. Which no. home is always light? Ah, uh, that house, they always have so much money. Oh, they're so rich. They're, they're rich. rich. That was the... That was the ancient way of saying they're rich. They didn't say that. They weren't talking about their cars or their house, but they had meat and fish. In them. You know what they say? That in Europe, if a Jew had chicken during the week, meaning not on Shabbat, one of them had to be sick. Either the chicken or the person. <laughs> they wanted to kill the chicken before it died, or the person was sick and they had to make chicken soup. Anyways. This is Lashon Hara. If expressed in a way that would portray the victim negatively, as though he were a glutton. Okay. And the Chavetz Chaim then continues, and these are just a few laws. Let's do, Brian, do the next one as well. Um, the prohibition of speaking Lashon Hara applies even if the speaker does not specify who he is speaking about, but from the story the listener can surmise yeah. who he is speaking of. Furthermore, even if the story told is not negative, but but through it some harm or shame will befall the victim, and this was the speaker's intent, this too falls in the category of Lashon Hara. This was called covert Lashon Hara by the same And sadly, you have so examples. I think there's an intent component here. Correct. Correct. There is an intent. For it to be Lashon Hara, you have to mean bad. Rachil would mean you didn't mean bad. Okay, Rachil is, I'm just, I didn't mean bad. Rachil is more of what could happen. Lashon Hara is already a problem. Um, what if you're saying, I'm thinking of being a consultant. What ha happens if you say these things to, to try to cause improvement? So that is going to be the text that we're going to have real soon, real soon. Um, and Otherwise, because of time, <laughs> because of time, I'll just summarize these last couple of texts. But 12, 12 a says, remember, Lashon Hara doesn't just hurt the person who it says it, but also to listen. Mm -hmm. So therefore, oh. when we are in a situation, we need to be careful. Um, it's very, very challenging. If one is able to walk away, you do. If one is one unable to, one is supposed to tell themselves in their mind, I will not believe what is being said. Change the channel. If you can change the conversation, good. If you can tell the people around you, hey, you know, I'd rather not be speaking about this person here, that's good. That doesn't always work, unfortunately. With some people, you say that, and guess what? They talk. Oh, you're just, it's going to be counterproductive. Oh, you're being the goody goody, right? So, so, but that is 12a is very important. We are often in situations where Lashon Har is being said. We need to do our best not to do that. They say mm -hmm. the punishment is worse from listening. They say that. Text 13 is what's called Abak Lashon Hara, which means Lashon. the dust of Lashon Hara. Um, you know, I don't want to tell you what happened to, to that. You know, that, that kind of, you throw <laughs> the, the, the teaser. I don't want to tell you what happened to this person. Or if someone praises someone in a crowd of people that they know they don't like that person. So you're actually lobbing a softball for them to hit it out of the park. You are encouraging them to then speak badly about this person. Isn't that so these are, these are, uh, this is Avak Lashon Hara. You haven't actually done the Lashon Hara, but you are setting the stage for Lashon Hara. Going to house, so we have Rachil, Lashon Hara, Avak Lashon Hara, which is, and then 
Exceptions to the rule, how, why don't you read it? You mentioned it, 14a. A person may relate certain matters to others to help the victim and to condemn wrongful deeds in a situation where he saw the person wrong his fellow man. For example, he robbed, cheated, or damaged someone, whether or not the victim is aware, or he knows that this person embarrassed or verbally harassed someone. He knows for certain that the perpetrator did not return the stolen goods or reimburse the victim for the damage done or did not seek forgiveness for his transgression. One is allowed to relate these matters to someone else, even if this was witnessed in private. However, be careful that these seven conditions delineated below are And we don't have all seven, but we've discussed this on classes here before. There are times how to protect someone, to save someone, you are allowed to talk. But there are seven conditions that the Chavetz Chaim writes we should do. And who are you telling it to is a big leap. Are you telling it to a group of people or only the person? Or someone who can really correct? remedy the situation. That's another one. Will anything be done out of this? Three is, um, is this fact or opinion? Four is, am I embellishing it in any way? Five is, do I have a personal agenda here? Other than helping, helping the other person? Six is an interesting one that, that even if even if this is so, will the end result be better or worse if I tell it? Sometimes what you're saying, no, no, so they're not going to be the best babysitter that one night. Nothing bad is going to happen, but this person's reputation will be harmed in a far worse way if you say it. So you have to weigh the pros and cons of telling over the story. And there's one or two I forgot, but those are good to keep a handy, these seven guidelines. I'm in trouble with one of them. And I'm paid to give the opinion. Uh, uh, but professional, if Eloshan Har on the professional, you know, we, we need a separate class on how that would work over here. Um, because that is, you know, you're, you're supposed to be giving your opinion about it. It's like being a newspaper man. But you know what? Do you get that, let's, no. let's finish here. We have, yeah. <laughs> when we go to the media, but, but let me just finish here with something you said. In many, many Jewish schools and traditions, they emphasize Lashon Hara a lot and how we always have to be on the guard against speaking. And it's very much impulse control. You want to speak it, don't speak it. Stop yourself. Stop yourself. In Chabad, the emphasis is more on what someone asked about thinking. Yeah. And that is the best antidote to Lashon Hara is by hitting it in the root. And the root is the way we look at Meaning, if we were to increase the love we have for one another, if we were to work on judging people favorably, if we were to work on the way we think, then we wouldn't always have to, right? Stop ourselves in the tracks before speaking it. And therefore, in Chabad, there is not as many classes as the one we have today. There are those that every single week will study a section from the Chafetz Chaim, that book. For the reasons I mentioned earlier, every day we have to protect ourselves against this. Um, and it is important. In Chabad, often the tradition is more discussing the importance of loving one another and truly seeing people in positive light and hoping that that helps us. So if it's and to in stop your, ourselves. If it's in your heart. Correct. Stop not, ourselves at it. that point. But although some of the ideas we discussed today are things we've done here before, it's important, really important every year have a class on this, realize just how big of an issue it is in Judaism, and realize how easy it is to slip up for everyone, everyone, you know. I Rabbi, uh, yes, we're holding uh, Debbie is, uh, said before, she said, we have industries built upon gossip, especially for celebrities. Absolutely. I didn't hear that. We have industries based upon gossip. We live in a world today where that's what people want to hear, and it's a sign, it's a sad sign. It's a very, very sad sign. People like talking about people. And lying. And lying. And lying. Yeah, and I mean, just making it like it's fine. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very sad. But again, that, that also stems from a very shallow, superficial place, you know? Just worry about your own life. But at least everyone it loves. Be, it used to be labeled gossip column. Now everybody puts it out there like, as when I'm it's saying fine. it's fact. Yeah. Correct. And it is it is a problem. It's you called know? Washington. <laughs> yeah. In the, in the, in any, the, any, uh, so we, let's finish for the online crowd. No, Thank that's so it. Much. What? That's it.
That's all. Thank you for listening. Uh, we will be back here next week, same time, same place. We're a little over. So anyone that has to run, please run. But if anyone has practical questions on Lashon Hara, ask away. There is something about when something has to come out. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson, Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, Current Affairs with Amnon Nissan, and if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on NissanCommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.